Okay, Shannon, we have about a minute to count down. I see people getting on the call. Um, for those of you who are on, if you would mute um, for the initial portion of our 30 minute conversation. Uh, if you do have questions at the end, I'll call upon you or you can put them in the chat room or you can email them to me, asilver at thechambernv.org so I can get those questions to Shannon Chambers directly and you'll get a written response by email. All right, um, Shannon, if you're ready, uh, click on your video and we will get started. Anyone else who'd like to be seen rather than just have their name posted, you're welcome to join the video and uh, just stay on mute if you would. So Shannon, I think you're there. Um, I am here, Anne, but I will tell you we are having video problems, so I do no apologize. Problem. Oh, that's um, okay. Don't the, worry joy, about it. the joys of um, computer yeah. technology. Exactly. I think you know we're all getting tired of seeing postage stamp sized photos of ourselves. So let me get started and, and welcome our chamber members and anyone who's decided to join our Chamber EDU series, which features influencers and decision makers, just like Shannon Chambers, our Nevada Labor Commissioner. And I welcome Shannon. And, and Shannon, if you would, just give, of us, give us a brief overview of your job description and the many duties you hold as Labor Commissioner. So good afternoon and, and thank you, Anne, for having me and welcome to the chamber members and I'm happy to do this. I'm the Nevada Labor Commissioner. I have been since 2014, which I will tell you, I'm, I'm a, one of the longest serving labor commissioners at this point, which tells you what this job entails. So we enforce minimum wage, overtime, employment practices, breaks and lunches. We also license private employment agencies, another huge part of our office is monitoring public works projects. So every school, road, library that gets built with public funds that's over $100,000, we monitor those projects and make sure a certain wage gets paid on those projects. On those projects as well, we enforce the Apprenticeship Utilization Act. So that passed last session where contractors have to use Shannon, you're cutting out just a little bit. New last session. So that's been in effect for a little over a year. And last session, coming out of last session, and I just bring that up because we just started a new legislative session. There were 13 bills that were passed that impact the Office of the Labor Commissioner. I don't think that that is going to be the case this session, knock on everything. You know, um, we've been monitoring the bill draft requests, been talking to some of the sponsors, and right now, the only visibility that I have um, knowledge of, of things that are out there, is Senate Bill 55 and then Senate Bill 67. And Senate Bill 55 deals with employee leasing agencies and who is going to be responsible for them the likelihood and the hope and if i get my amendment through is that those will be moved to the office of the labor commissioner senate bill 67 deals with public works projects and i'm not really going to get into that a lot of the other bill draft requests that are out there and i will communicate with um, your executive director on those it just basically says you know, revises provisions relating to employment. <laughs> so we don't know how those are gonna take shape and what, what's gonna come out of those. My guess and my, my sense of things is that there will be a bill at some point that revises the paid leave bill. So that was Senate Bill 312 from last session, which implemented a new paid leave requirement for employers in the state of Nevada who had 50 or more employees that started out as a paid sick leave bill and ended up as just a paid leave bill because of the events of COVID-19 and realizing now that sick leave and time off for things like testing and vaccinations, my sense, and I can't guarantee this, but my sense is that bill and that law 
might be amended to some type of a paid sick leave bill. Again, I can't guarantee that, but just given the events of COVID-19 and kind of you know what's gone on, that's my guess. I can't guarantee that, um, but there is a gap right now, and not to jump ahead, Ann, but there is a gap right now in that the Family First Federal Coronavirus Relief Act is technically now expired. It expired December 31st, 2020. So there are still employers that are following that. That was optional, um, basically starting January 1st of 2021. But we now have a situation and I'm going to be putting out some guidance um, just so all of your members know <laughs> that we will be putting out some guidance about leave for vaccinations because that is becoming an issue now. We are having people contact us and tell us that, you know, I was supposed to go get vaccinated today and my employer said I can't have the time off. I'm using that as a very extreme example, but this is happening. And we really have no directive at the state or federal level right now. So the labor commissioner is going to be jumping in on this issue and will provide some clear guidance. Um, again, you know, that certainly can be challenged by an employer and, you know, at their discretion, but the message should be, we are being told to be vaccinated. And if that is something that you're mandating as an employer, you need to provide the time for the employee to do that. And you must know, and unfortunately, you must know that even though they say it takes an hour, it's going to take four. Um, I have family members who are in law enforcement and family members who fit into the over 70 category who went to go be vaccinated and it took them over four hours. So again, these are not perfect situations, but employers, and I appreciate especially smaller employers, it's hard to have somebody out of the office for four hours. It's hard to have people out, but we need to really, um, as a state, respect the fact that not only the governor, but the federal government has made getting vaccinated a priority and time needs to be allowed for employees to do that. Now that doesn't mean that you cannot have them, you know, make up the time another day or flex their hours or telework or whatever they need to do. But I think the message needs to be that this is a public health priority. So time needs to be given to get those vaccinations. And it's not just one, it's two. So the more employers plan ahead and, and make arrangements and have alternatives and discuss that with their employees, the better. And you know that's, that's a big issue right now. And like I said, that really kind of hit my office this week. Mm. And that's a big problem. And it, you know, the unfortunate side of this too, and I'm not gonna get into the health side of it, but there's only a limited number of appointments and I'm one of those people who's looking for an appointment. I'll tell you that right now as the labor commissioner, I can't get an appointment. So if somebody has an appointment and they don't show up or they can't make it because their employer tells them they can't get one, that throws a whole you know, different set of, of problems into the mix. And so I wanna make that message very, very clear um, to you and to all your members. And I will say this, you know, I know your members are conscientious and will do the right thing, but this issue really hit this week. And like I said, I will be putting out some guidance on it and it will be pretty strong and pretty firm that time needs to be given to get vaccinated. So um, Shannon, I, I look forward to your guidance and we'll certainly disseminate it among all our members. Um, it's hard to imagine even a small employer denying an employee the opportunity to get vaccinated, but I'm sure you've encountered all sorts of situations and we'll do whatever we can uh, from the standpoint of the Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce, ensuring that our 2000 plus members know full well that making accommodations, flexing hours, allowing people to take that time off to wait in line uh, is critical. We're not gonna get done with this pandemic until we get uh, at least 85% of our population vaccinated. So um, 
I look forward to your guidance and we'll surely get that out to everyone. I wanna to segue to another aspect of, of this conversation and you've alluded to it in speaking about vaccinations, but the big issue that we're getting uh, here at the chamber um, is what employers can do if an employee refuses to get vaccinated. Now, you've, you've talked about the fact we should accommodate and your guidance will help employers understand that at every juncture, they should be encouraging employees to get vaccinated and understanding that the time period to get those is a certain window and then a certain number of hours are involved. And hopefully no one's going to um, be going, you know, uh, for a lark at the shopping mall rather than waiting for their vaccine. So hopefully we'll make best assumptions that people are, are doing what they say they're going to do and make and will make that time available. But I, I know that we've had calls from employers who are asking, can I make getting a vaccine a condition of employment? And in researching, uh, you know, I think most of our members are aware of the Americans with Disabilities Act, better known as the ADA, and Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prevents us from discriminating against employees. So I'm wondering if you can respond to the issue of employer mandates regarding uh, the vaccine and the legitimacy of requiring employees to sign up and get them. So Anne, based on the federal guidance and the law as I know it and interpret it and talking about the Americans with Disabilities Act and Title VII, an employer can mandate the vaccine Mm -hmm. What's important for the employer to do is to document that the vaccine is necessary and required because those employees are engaging in activities where they're coming into contact with the public, where they could potentially pose, and the term is a direct threat because they potentially could have COVID or have been exposed to COVID. So the employer certainly can mandate it, but again, they can't just say it's mandatory without any type of justification. So if you have an employee, and I'm gonna use an extreme example, if you have an employee that literally works from home 99% of the time and doesn't come into contact with anybody, you probably don't wanna say that it's mandatory for that employee without some type of real justification for your frontline workers, your essential workers, and I'm using those terms, that come into contact with either coworkers or with the public, where they could potentially expose somebody else, you absolutely can mandate it. But again, you need to document, document, document that. And the other kind of example I will use is, it's a different example, but, it was Assembly Bill 132 that got passed last session talking about marijuana, and it's a different example, but they're, they're similar and you'll see why, is you can absolutely have drug testing and you can absolutely not hire somebody for testing positive for marijuana, but you need to make the correlation to why they cannot be smoking marijuana or test positive for marijuana because of that job duty and what they're doing. So, mm -hmm. You know, I think you're going to see two different reactions to this, especially from employers. You're going to have the employers that are like, it's mandatory for everybody and everybody has to get it and not do the analysis position by position by position of why it's necessary and do the, you know, unfortunately the work to make that path clear. And then you're going to have the other employers that will just be like, well, they can go get vaccinated or not. I'm not going to worry about it. It's up to them. Um, you know, that poses its own risk too. But what I would say is if you have workers and I'm thinking of restaurants, I'm thinking of, you know, clothing establishments and I'm not going to list them all or, or somebody that's coming into somebody else's house, you know, those positions in my view and based on the guidance from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and our own state public health officials, those are the types of positions where the vaccine should be mandatory. And, you know, I know myself as the labor commissioner, you know, we're considered what they call continuity of governance. So 
if I get sick and I'm out, then the labor commissioner's office, I mean, it'll still function, but those big decisions that I get paid to make don't get made. So those are the types of positions where you can mandate it and you should mandate it. But again, you need to explain and have that conversation and have your policies very, very clear why it's necessary and why if they don't have it, it could potentially pose a direct threat or a significant risk of harm to not only the individual, but to the customers and to the other coworkers. Shannon, if you would um, dive a little deeper into a legitimate objection an individual might have to getting vaccinated that would in fact be covered under the American with the Americans with Disabilities Act. So the two big ones are religious beliefs. And then the other one is a disability. So there is some type of medical condition. um, And I'm going to use that term broadly, but Mm -hmm. there is a substantiated disability where potentially having that vaccine could cause that person harm. And I'll focus on on this part of it first, and we'll go back to the religious beliefs. But Mm -hmm. even with a disability, so under the Americans with Disabilities Act, even if an employee says, I'm refusing to take the vaccine because of a disability, you do have the right to engage in the conversation of what is the disability? Is is it something that's already known? Um, Is it something that the employee needs to provide proof of? An employer is certainly entitled to ask all those questions and go down that road. So regardless of HIPAA HIPAA and um, the the protections uh, of privacy, an employer can say, for instance, if it's an unseen disability, um, the employer is entitled to say, may I ask what that disability is and what prevents you from getting the vaccine? Can you legitimately ask that question? You can. Okay. But again, you have to be you have to be very precise and very um, again strictly keeping it within the confines of what what is the disability mm-hmm. and asking those types of questions specifically related to the position and if it's something that's already known if it's mm-hmm. an, an a disability that's already known. Mm-hmm. You know, then at that point, that triggers kind of a different analysis, but the employer does have a right to ask what is the disability. Now, if the employee refuses to tell them, that brings up a whole kind of other set of potential issues that can can go there. But, you know, I haven't seen anything from the EEOC or from Nevada Equal Rights Commission or, or any of those um, agencies that says you cannot ask that question. Now, okay. if they refuse, the guidance seems to say, then you kind of need to figure out if you can find some type of an accommodation for them and some other type of work situation. And if you can't, then you can potentially go to termination. That also ties into if they have an actual documented disability that you know about and you're asking them to get vaccinated and they refuse, the guidance says you have to try and make an accommodation, either telework or whatever, first before you terminate them. So the message I want to leave with you, Anne, and your members is it's not just I refuse to get the vaccination. I have a disability. I'm not going to tell you. And then the employer says, well, I can terminate you. It's not that fast and quick. And that is the guidance that's being put out is the employers. And and I feel for all of you that the burden is really going to be on you to ask those questions and document, document, document. And then if there really is no reasonable accommodation, then you can proceed with termination. And, and I would say this, putting vaccinations aside, putting anything aside, 
you know, even though Nevada is quote unquote an at will state, I never recommend employers fire anybody without cause or without documentation or without reason. So in this particular situation and, and knowing potentially that all these decisions are a potential lawsuit, again, because this is all brand new. <laughs> um, and so make sure you follow all the steps and document, document, document. And, you know, the, the issue with a disability, again, putting the vaccine aside, the issue with a disability is what they look to under the ADA is, did you try and accommodate the employee? Did you try and find other options? Did you try, you know, to do the steps and, you know, whatever it is, modified work schedule, um, you know, stand up. To, I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying here, but that's sure. what they look to under the ADA. They don't look to person said they had a disability. Okay, so I just fired him. I mean, that, that'll get you in trouble every day of the week, putting the vaccine aside. So document, document, document. Um, again, you do have the right to ask the person, what is your disability? And, you know, require them to provide some type of documentation of that. Okay. Um, if they don't, then you, you work to the next step of document. They didn't then you can potentially go to termination. All right, let me dig a little deeper on a religious objection um, and what constitutes a valid religious objection. I, I wouldn't imagine it's just saying to the employer, you know, I, I don't believe in vaccines. It's got to be a little more demonstrated than that. So this one is tougher, I will tell you, <laughs> um, yeah. because it's, I mean, and I'm gonna say this in the nicest way is, there are people out there who claim religious beliefs that are not in any type of organized religious structure. Mm -hmm. So the guidance that I have read, and I've talked to the executive director of the EEOC at the federal level is, you know, essentially, if they're saying it's a religious belief, you again have the right to ask the question. Um, if they refuse to say what it is or say what that religion is or what the actual belief is, you can document that and again, potentially go to termination. The step in between, even with the religious claim is, can you find some other position for them where they're not gonna be in contact with the public or where they can telework or you know where they're not gonna pose a direct threat and that's the word to the public and other coworkers, but I will tell you, this is the one, and I've been on several calls, this is the one where everybody thinks that there's gonna be the majority of the lawsuits, mm -hmm. because how do you prove a religious belief? And I'm just saying that, and I'm not meaning yeah. that in any way to anybody, <laughs> um, right. but that's harder to prove than a disability, because a disability, you have to go to the doctor, you get documentation, you get different, official things that say I'm disabled, a religious belief is, it's a belief. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be a harder call. And that's the best way I can say it. And I'm not going to try and, and dance around that. Um, you know, I think you're going to have employees who are going to take advantage of that. Um, again, to the extent they don't want to get vaccinated, I mean, whatever. Um, but my advice to that one is you can ask the question again if they refuse to tell you and you can't accommodate them then you have the right to proceed with a termination shannon just to explore this a bit further so an individual who may say i have concerns about the efficacy of the vaccine or its long-lasting effects or how it was developed so quickly do not constitute religious objections no they don't okay no, they don't. Okay. We now, are now I would say this, and, and this is this is an area and it's it's being actively discussed right now mm -hmm. for women and for females, the concern about potential issues with fertility mm -hmm. and yeah. those types of things, that is a much more valid 
it's an in-between area. And again, that is being discussed not only at the state level, but the federal level. Right. That is viewed to be a much more valid, um, valid concern than just saying, you know, I don't believe in vaccines or, or different things like that. Again, the guidance on that is try and accommodate the, the employee as best you can. But at the end of the day, if it's an essential position that is dealing with the public and upfront and face to face with various people, you do have a right to, to terminate that employee. And the issue with that is, and again, I'm not trying to get into anybody's life or body or anything, but especially for somebody that's not not pregnant or you know has maybe no no idea when they may meet the perfect person to go through that whole process. As an employer, you have much more flexibility to mm -hmm. to go down a potential termination because those aren't real live issues is the best way I could say it. But that is that is an area that, you know, I know, and I've had a, several conversations with some very, very big employers and, you know, what they're trying to do is, and again, it depends on the nature of your operations, but sure. for those types of employees, they are trying to find alternative workarounds, um, you know, temporarily so that they don't go down the termination road. But again, for a small business or for something where somebody has to work the counter day to day, that just is not gonna be possible. Let, let me ask you um, something else in, in light of the vaccine. Um, a recent poll, and I read them every day, uh, you know, one poll shows that at least 85% of Americans will need to be vaccinated to create the ultimate herd immunity. And I'm not speaking about the ultimate global um, percentage that will be needed if international travel is going to continue. But in Nevada, uh, we have about a 77% uh, willingness to get the vaccine, which leaves a whole lot of potential employees who are concerned, anxious, um, for one reason or, or the other, may not want to. So that leaves a, a lot of room for many employers to begin the process of developing a statement about its intentions do you recommend uh, that personnel policy manuals be changed or revised or that a simple statement or memo from the employer is, is sufficient to alert employees well in advance that their intention is to require the vaccine? So I think it should be in the policies and procedures. Mm -hmm. I think at a minimum, a memo, something documented in writing that was okay. sent to the employees of this is this is what we're going to do. This is why we're going to do it. This is the nature of our operations. Mm -hmm. I could tell you that if a claim came to the labor commissioner or a complaint, if there was nothing in writing from the employer, and this goes to all issues, that would cause me a lot of concern. Right. So I think employers need to jump on this now Mm -hmm. and have a policy, have a procedure, like I said, a minimum, a memo, but have it signed by the employee. Mm -hmm. And I would do that too for any type of pre-hire as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is our company policy so that you kind of can <laughs> know that from the start. And, you know, we've all been there uh, interviewing for jobs and different things where even before the interview, they have you sign you know, can you perform the essential functions of the job? Can you do, you know, I would take all those steps, but I would absolutely say it has to be in your policies and procedures. And that will help potentially with any type of claim and complaint, but I would start that now. And I would also start um, kind of back to my first topic of put something in there about time off to get vaccinated, not just sure. for the first, but for the second dose. And mm -hmm. so that employers are clear on that and that the employees are clear on that, but I would do every single one of those things. Well, I, I would find it very discouraging if we had chamber members whose um, employers or the employers themselves who might be on the phone do not allow individuals time to get the vaccine. Now, I understand if someone says I'm going to need three days, but if someone says I have an appointment at the following time and place, 
uh, that should be honored and we'll be advocating for that very strongly. Um, we, we certainly want to see the return of a robust economy and a vaccine, regardless of anyone's individual concerns or beliefs or political feelings about it, is the only medical way we know at this point um, to protect ourselves unless we want masks stapled to our faces for the rest of our lives. You know, Shannon, I don't want to run over time, but I want anyone who's on the call who has a question, if you could raise your hand with the little um, emoji and or just... Uh, ask your question. I don't see any hands up. Um, Christine is asking, is there any type of federal, state, or local law that requires employers to address employees? I can't see the rest of the statement. Christine, maybe you could just ask your question. Yeah, I actually had two questions. So the first sure. one is, is there any type of federal, state, or local law that requires employers to address employees' vaccination status or is that an area that they, you know, have have the ability to to not even broach the topic altogether? Hmm. Interesting. Shannon? So, I mean, that's that's a good question. Again, I think that it depends on as an employer how you are going to basically kind of classify your employees and who's going to be and and this has been going on for 12 months now of who's frontline, who's essential, who's continuity, who are, who are those things. So you may be an employer and, and you may be an employer that's like, I don't even care. I don't care if they're vaccinated. I don't care. And that's up to you because there is no federal law right now and no state law saying you have to get vaccinated. It's really up to the employer. So you know, um, you can take that approach. I wouldn't take that approach as an employer. Um, but I mean, addressing your question, there is no law saying you have to get vaccinated. There's also a question from Heidi Parker regarding giving employees time off relative to any side effects they may have. And we've all been informed that if you do get vaccinated, there's a certain period of time, I believe it's 15 minutes that you're asked to wait to see if you experiencing experience anything extreme as a reaction to the vaccine. But I assume that if someone goes home that evening and has chills or a fever or any of the potential side effects that we would want employers to accommodate and understand that individual's need to take additional time off, whether it's paid or not, is, is something we'll, we'll lean on you for, Shannon. But uh, that's a very good question that Heidi's posed. It's not just the immediate shot or shots, it's the potential reaction. And there's been some evidence that the second shot creates a stronger reaction. So if there's any legislation that's going to come about uh, encouraging or mandating that employers provide that time off, I would hope it includes for a time for the individual to recover from any potential side effects within reason. Um, and I, I think, you know, taking three weeks off following the COVID shot would be extreme, but perhaps a morning or an afternoon or the following day, one, one would understand that. No, and I agree, Anne, and, and that was back to my kind of my original point that, you know, when they say it's going to take an hour, it's going to take four, and I'm not mm -hmm. saying that's fair to employers, but, mm -hmm. you know, um, I fortunately, and I, you know, for good, good reasons, I haven't had to be tested and I haven't got, but you know, even when the testing kind of wave was going through, I heard from people that they were there between six to eight hours. And then, you know, my just personal experience, members of my family who recently got vaccinated, again, law enforcement and then over 70, it took them at least two to three hours. So again, I'm not saying that's fair to an employer, but I think you need to expect that. And I think for the second second phase of it, um, you know, you may have to expect that that person may need to take a day off. Now, having said that, if it extends to two or three, you know, the, the rule typically is after three days, you have a right to start asking questions and you have right. a right to start potentially taking um, progressive actions, whether it's based on attendance or based on other things. Sure. So I would be mindful of that. I mean, the unfortunate part of all this is it shouldn't be a free for all for, to your point, Anne, for an employee right. to go get a vaccine and then go catch a movie. That's not what yeah. any of this is intended <laughs> for. But unfortunately, we know that 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 may happen. But again, you know, just do what you can and try and 
you know, most employees of, hey, you know, you can make up those hours on Friday or you have paid leave you can use or have the discussion. And I'm going to get back to this point kind of, and I've said this over and over is what I've seen through this whole COVID-19 event, and I'll just call it that, is there has been an absolute breakdown of the employer and employee relationship. Mm -hmm. And I can't put my finger on it. I don't know if it was there before and this just brought it out, but some of the issues that we're seeing in our office, it's just no communication, no interaction, just sometimes no common sense. And the frustration on the employer side, I absolutely 100% appreciate. You've been asked to shut down. You've been asked to open. You've been asked to shut down again. However, there are still labor laws and there are still requirements. And I have talked to private labor attorneys and I'm not saying I am the smartest person, but they're like, that is absolutely what is going on. There is a breakdown in the employer and employee relationship. And the next phase of this is the vaccine part of it. Mm -hmm. So that is why having a policy procedure, communicating up front, mm -hmm. and having the expectations set up front will hopefully prevent issues on the other side. But we're kind of now at that stage now. We were in stage one where we all had to shut down stage two, where we all kind of came back to work and realized, hey, we're going to take a pay cut or less hours. Stage three is, I don't like being back to work, <laughs> and so I'm going to act out in different ways. Now we're kind of in stage four, where we are getting back to work, and people are going to have to decide they're either going to get vaccinated or they're not. And if it's part of that business and part of that employer's requirements, then they potentially could be terminated and move on and go find somewhere else to work. But that's kind of how I see it. And that's the point I leave all the time. Talk to your employees, communicate with them, document, document, document. And it, 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 it pays off so much. I can't even begin to tell you how much it pays off. Shannon, I, I see that Carissa has a question. Carissa, if you can unmute yourself, go ahead and ask. Carissa, are you still on? I see your hand up. Please ask your question. I did not mean to have my hand up. Oh, um, okay. This is Carissa Loper. I'm sorry. Oh, that's I, all right. I do see Christine Brown had another question in the yes. chat, but Christine, yeah, not me. <laughs> Thank you. Have you. A little, you have a little hand underneath your name, but I'm sorry for calling on you um, unexpectedly. Christine, go ahead with your second question. Sure. Um, so really quickly, the, the first one is probably really simple to answer, which is, is there a place where employers can find examples of policy language that they can put in their employee handbooks um, as it pertains to communicating vaccine policy and mandates um, if they exist? And then um, the second question, I, I hope it's not too far in the weeds, but let's say an employer decides to not broach the topic of vaccination with its, with its employees. And, and a patron of that business contracts coronavirus and is able to reasonably trace it back to that business, would that business owner then be under any kind of liability or potential negligence? Um, you know, if, if someone contracted coronavirus from their business um, and, uh, and, and did not have that conversation about vaccination with its employees? So in response to your first question, I will see what I can track down what what's happening now and you know the the industrial nature of the American society and business entrepreneurs and HR entrepreneurs is there's a whole new set of HR professionals, human resources professionals that are offering their services to generate policies and procedures to deal with all these issues. So I will see if I can track down some of the better ones that I have seen um, to the first question. The second question is, I would say all those things are on the table for a potential lawsuit. And that's why I do believe that many of these issues we're going to end up in court and in litigation on these issues. I am aware of a couple lawsuits in California where, and it's involving employees, 
where the employee got coronavirus and they're blaming it on the employer because they say they got sick at work. So those cases are working their way through the courts, but there is a factor for an employer that they're going to have to consider that if they don't have employees that are vaccinated and a customer comes in and potentially gets sick, that could impact your liability coverage with insurance um, on the employee side, potentially your workers' comp insurance. So I don't want to answer that those are absolutes. They're going to be a case-by-case -case analysis, but I think all of those questions and on the insurance side, and I work with the insurance commissioner, we're right next to each other as far as our offices. You're going to have insurance companies now when you go to renew your workers' comp policy or you go to renew your liability policy. And I'm, they're going to ask that question. Are your employees vaccinated? Sure. That makes sense. It's like filling out your insurance forms and asking if you smoke or how often you drink. Right. Um, right. I, I appreciate that. And Christine, hopefully that's that's answered or at least attempted to answer your question. I don't want to run over time here, Shannon. I think we could chat for hours. We'll undoubtedly get you on our Chamber EDU series again um, in the future. Hopefully everybody's benefited from this conversation. Shannon, if you could give us your email address, because I know there are going to be follow-up questions or issues or concerns, and I would like people to be able to reach you directly, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. So my email, it's my name. It's um, S-H-A-N-N-O-N, -N, no space, my last name, C-H-A-M-B-E-R-S, at labor.nv.gov. And so that is my direct email. And as Ann knows, I will respond and I will talk to you. And, you know, I That's just, great. the only thing I ask is don't... <laughs> Don't get mad if you don't like the answer and um, send me a lot of unhappy emails because I do get those on occasion too, but um, you're more than welcome to reach out to me and sometimes just asking the right question ahead of time um, can, can help prevent things. Well, Shannon, you've been terrific. You've been on the phone with our members of various times throughout this event, as you call it, and I'm sure there'll be future occasions to get you on the line. I do appreciate um, you following up by sending me so I can disseminate any information you may have on a, a, a standard policy or even memo statement regarding an employer's desire or request or mandate to have everybody get vaccinated. And of course, you'll keep us up to date and we'll put out in our twice weekly chamber briefings any information that comes out regarding um, the vaccine and the, the, the relative to Title VII or ADA. Uh, we may all encounter those situations and we want to be wise and, and prudent as to how we approach them, understanding that questions will have to be asked, documentation will have to occur, and uh, possible follow-up, be it uh, ultimate accommodation of allowing someone to work from home, uh, continue remotely, or it could result in termination of employment. So whatever information you can share with me, I will share with all our members. With that, I thank you very, very much for your time. As always, this could go on for a very long time, but we're, we're gonna let you get back to all those phone calls and uh, hopefully they're all friendly and uh, supportive of what you're doing as labor commissioner. So thank you, Shannon, very much. Thank you, well, everybody. Again, thank for you so much, Ann, and, and thank you to the chamber and happy to do it and um, to health and happiness and to a brighter day and month and year ahead. So that's absolutely what I'll leave everybody with. Thank you. All right. Stay safe. Be well. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.